Good evening, good evening. How is everyone? All right. My name is John Bader. I'm the executive director of the Fulbright Association, and I am delighted and honored to welcome you to the 45th annual conference of our great association. If you're happy about that, wave your hands in the air. There you go. All right. Yes, it's been three long years, three long years since we've been together in person. I want to take a moment to thank the scientists, the researchers, nurses, doctors, medical, uh, mental health professionals, and so many others who, who have helped us combat COVID-19 so that we can finally enjoy this reunion together. In fact, the next time we meet as a community at the Fulbright Prize event on April 19th at the Grand Hyatt here in Washington, we will get another chance to thank this very community for their hard work and their heroism. Here in Bethesda, we are less than two miles, really walking distance, to the National Institutes of Health, which is where Drs. Kazmekia Corbett and Anthony Fauci teamed together to literally save the world. So we will be honoring those two at the Fulbright Prize that evening, and we hope very much that you will be there. Before I offer a brief introduction to this conference and then to start our exceptional program this evening, I would like to um, acknowledge the people whose land we are standing on today. That is the Susquehannock tribe, the Piscataway peoples, including the Piscataway Conoy tribe and the Choptico band of the Piscataway Indian nation. It is important, it is vital, it is right to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices they were forced to make. In remembering the Susquehannock tribe, the Piscataway people's communities, we honor their memory, their lives, and their descendants. We also remember that we are guests of this land and we must do our best to never forget its original inhabitants. Such respect for other cultures and peoples is deep in the bones of the Fulbright community, a community we will celebrate and enjoy over the next few days. Allow me to highlight a few of our plenary programs, share some housekeeping and give thanks to the people and institutions who have made this conference possible. I know you will enjoy the Selma Jean Cohen dance lecture tomorrow uh, late morning, featuring Katakali performer and anthropologist, Dr. Janaki Nair. Later that afternoon, we gather to see a film that will build a more measured and informed perspective on the complex life and legacy of Senator Fulbright himself. After dinner on your own, where I hope you'll discuss that film and its meaning to you, we will get together for a party. I understand this is unusual for Fulbrighters, but you're allowed to have fun, so it's really okay. <laughs> the blue ticket that you have in your, in your name tag, that is your, that is your drink ticket for that evening. Uh, of course, if you really want to have fun, you're going to have to get more than one ticket, which also means you're going to have to bring some hold cold card cash with you in order to, uh, to buy more of those. On Saturday afternoon, we'll be doing something else new for this conference. We will offer an overview of the association's programs and opportunities to volunteer, followed by a programs fair so that you can get even more engaged than you are now. That evening at an awards dinner, we will celebrate the amazing volunteers and chapters that power our mission. All along, please explore and attend the many panels, posters, uh, uh, round tables, presentations, exhibitions. If you are presenting any of these and you are involved in that, please raise your hand right now. So if you're a panelist or a presenter, yeah, this is gonna be great. Thank you so, so much. I'm deeply grateful to all of you for the rich, provocative content that we will enjoy over the next few days. All of us will leave here inspired, challenged, and educated and I'm so excited uh, to be listening and to be attending these. Each morning, you'll also get a chance to stretch and be centered thanks to yoga 
We have, um, uh, I, I probably will not be able to get up that early, but you should. Um, <laughs> so, so please be there. Uh, it's on, it'll be on the rooftop. There's a wonderful view of Bethesda from up there. You do have to register for this. Uh, and the way to do that is to use our new conference app. Yes, we have joined the 21st century and we have a conference app. We've never done this before and I know almost all of you are incredibly skeptical about this. Um, but it is a wonderful resource. You can find out all about programs and announcements. Please, uh, please engage with that. As you enjoy these days of reunion, I hope you will join me in thanking those who've made this possible. Of course, we start with you, our friends and supporters, members of the association, donors. I am very grateful to our national board of directors, uh, led so exceptionally by my friend and mentor and partner, uh, the Honorable Cynthia Baldwin. Thank you, Cynthia. Many members of our 1946 society are here um, among our most generous and loyal supporters, and I thank them as well. In your physical program and on that app, you will see a list of our institutional members, so important to our mission and outreach and our sponsors. We cannot do these conferences or really any of our programs without significant financial support of these organizations. Many thanks to the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the State Department, uh, which is sponsoring our chapter leadership workshop and they fund chapter activities nationwide. So uh, we're grateful to ECA. Uh, Auburn University is probably as loyal a sponsor as I can imagine. So I'm, uh, thank you for, to Auburn. We also thank the Penn State uh, Global at Pennsylvania State University, the University of South Florida, the WEGG Prize, and the Fulbright Teacher Exchanges. I am blessed to be working with a remarkable, talented, fantastic group of professionals, and I'd like to recognize them right now. I hope they're in the room. Fiona Breslin, Stephen Gardner, Claire Jagla, Munir Sayeh, uh, Christine Oswald, and Alicia Montague. Are you guys here? Can you raise your hands? Yeah, um, I, I am a very, very lucky man. Finally, I am delighted to announce to you what you may have already learned, which is that we will gather for the 46th annual conference in Denver, Colorado next October. Uh, that's October 19 to 22, yes, there you go. We are a national organization and community, so it is time that we acknowledged anyone west of the Appalachian Mountains. So, we are going west uh, and hope you will join us there along with your friends and other Fulbrighters and where your organization can be one of our sponsors. There's your plug for the last second. Now it is my overdue duty to introduce, uh, to start our program and turn it over to my friend and national board member, uh, former uh, ambassador from Hungary, Reka Svermakin. Reka? Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you really everyone in this wonderful board and in this wonderful group of uh, people for this very important opportunity. And I think we have a very special chance today to start our annual conference in a very, very, on a very, very important strategic and really um, um, crucial uh, development of the uh, past year. The world uh, that we have seen, which I think has been completely uh, unexpected by a lot of us in the, uh, in the room. The world today is really appalled to see uh, Russia's war crimes in Ukraine and the um, barbaric war tactics that are being implied. The, um, the people of Ukraine, the Ukrainians, are doing spectacularly fantastic in standing up to this pressure, in um, being an, an incredible, uh, sending an incredible message to all of us about defense, about values, about fighting for our common values, and about the importance of 
uh, freedom and independence. I believe this is a powerful message that we all have taken in the last few months, and this is why we are so honored and very uh, excited to have the ambassador of Ukraine among us. Russia is roiling. There are so many int- developments inside that is really, you can feel how difficult, how uh, much change, how many changes, how much is happening behind the um, the uh, narrative, the propaganda war that is on the surface uh, from Russian uh, media. We're seeing the world in reacting massively supporting Ukraine. And as a, resu- as a result of this incredible, impressive, heroic fight that Ukraine has been put up, we really wanted to welcome this, we wanted to honor this, and we, we were thinking that the best way to do this is to invite the representative of Ukraine to start our annual discussion with her opening remarks. So we're extremely honored to have Ambassador uh, Mark Karova among us today. As a sentence of introduction of an incredibly impressive career that's behind her, and that uh, allows me to say that I am particularly personally happy to know you as a, as a wonderful diplomat, as a fantastic um, expert, as a wonderful leader, as a mother, and as a representative of a wonderful country among us. Uh, just a few sentences of, your, of the background uh, of this fantastic career. Um, Ambassador Markova is also a former Minister of Finance. Um, she worked um, in, as minist- as in the Ministry of Finance as a uh, minister on several key strategic initiatives of her country. One of these is certainly, for instance, if I may just enumerate uh, them, one of this is to start a, um, uh, the, uh, public fi- in the public finance sector, one of the largest open data uh, um, initiative uh, in Ukraine, as a result of which he was awarded the Open Data Leader Award uh, back in 2018 already. Also as an MFA leader, she uh, um, was the creator, the uh, initiator of Ukraine Invest Investment Attraction and Support Office, which uh, helped massively to open up the Ukrainian market to international investors and to leading up to a number of fundamental changes in her country and in the economy uh, of Ukraine. As a, she worked in the private sector and she has a, a wonderful career uh, in uh, the governmental, the civic sector as well. Um, as part of her commitment to uh, strengthen U.S.-Ukrainian ties, she is here. I don't think that she could have been here in a better and more important moment. So. Please join me welcoming the ambassador, Her Excellency Oksana Markarova, here on stage. Thank you. Dear Fulbright Association members, ladies and gentlemen, friends, it's uh, a big honor for me to be here with you tonight. It's, it's a great way to finish a day, to be in the room full of so nice and smart people at the same time. And I know that because we have a Fulbrighter in our embassy team. She's here with me, Katerina Smahli, and I'm very fortunate to have her with me as the team member. Um, in the next two days, and I was, it was so interesting to hear the program, I wish I could be here rather than doing my job, but you know, it, it's going to be a great program and a great reunion, and you will talk about so many things, but of course, because of this unprecedented war in Ukraine, because of how Russia violated pretty much all international laws and all principles, uh, of course your discussions will be centered on the issues of peace. Of course you will be talking about what is it that we all together missed that the world did not stop and did not prevent something like this from happening. You will talk about the democracy and you will talk about whether democracies can not only deliver to their people, to our people, but also defend themselves. Can we all be peaceful and live the way we want to live and still not be attacked by a violent neighbor, by a much larger nuclear state, uh, which is on the Security Council of the UN? In the last months of this 
truly senseless war. I mean, not senseless for us because we are defending our homes and loved ones, but senseless from the standpoint why Russia even started that war, to invade a foreign country, to invade a neighbor, peaceful neighbor in the 21st century when we all uh, in academia, in, in uh, expert communities, in decision-making communities, in normal countries, do not even think in terms of land, do not even think in terms of conquering someone. We think about how to get the ideas, how to develop our countries, how to leapfrog into the next centuries. And now we are facing with this 19th century deeds that are done in the 21st century. In the last eight months, we have received so many letters from universities, scholars, from, uh, from, from the academic community broadly. And these messages were filled, of course, with sympathy, with sorrow, with uh, admiration of our courageous fight. Uh, but also, they focused a lot about these principles of democracy and international law and how everyone in the international, in the, in the, in the, uh, expert community and especially in the educational community, academia, and you know, people in this room understand that this fight is so much bigger than Ukraine. Although of course it's existential for us. Um, standing here today, I want to thank all of you and I want to thank all the academic institutions for making everything possible and sometimes impossible to provide psychological, financial, and academic support to our Ukrainian academic institutions. We have almost 2,000 uh, 2, students from Ukraine studying in US universities today. Uh, we have a number of universities in the United States supporting universities in Ukraine, in, in Kyiv, and in other places, especially universities that had to flee from, from places like Mariupol and Kharkiv. Some of them had to relocate the second time after they relocated from Crimea or from Donetsk and Lugansk in 2014, because we all in this room know that this war did not start 225 days ago. The full-fledged phase of it, yes. But the war started eight years ago, and we have been fighting this for quite some time now. So of course, in the last 225 days, uh, it's, an experience that none of us expected to live through, again, in the 21st century. And we had to reconsider a number of life priorities, and we had to rethink about how we do things, and I definitely, when, accept, when I was accepting the uh, proposal from my president to, to become an ambassador, come back to the public sector, go to the US, because of my financial background, of course we were thinking about you know, strategic partnership in terms of investment and economic development and trade and, and everything that I was going to focus on. And now I know more about the weapons than I ever thought I would know, you know, all the details that, that, that my husband sometimes jokes that my next career probably would be like arms trading or something, you know, like I, like I have to use this knowledge somehow in the, in the future. So this really troubling and cruel times have forced us all, once again, the, to, to, to appreciate the importance of public diplomacy and to appreciate the importance of soft power, even though, again, I talk about the, the weapons and sanctions and all the hard stuff all the time, both publicly and with our partners. But we have to, we have, we have to acknowledge that this war actually brought us back to the understanding how important the education and academic pro programs are. I can definitely say that Ukraine's victory on the battlefield and the resilience of our society uh, was made possible, of course, because of the courage of our president. I mean, undoubtedly, the leadership in these times, the, our defenders, the armed forces that, that are fighting on the front lines, but also the, the fact that during the past 30 years, after we became independent, that we have embraced the ideas of educational reform, that we have opened ourselves, unlike Russia, to the ideas of, of, uh, of uh, international community and the global thinking. And your program, the Fulbright program, have been such a critical element of that success. Uh, just a couple of facts, you know, from the day of its inception in early 1992, it was just a year after Ukraine regained its independence after almost 70 years under occupation by the Soviet Union, the program office 
uh, has played a vital role in the, in the development of Ukrainian educational system, not just the program itself, but actually doing the change on the ground. The program had a modest beginning with only 10 American scholars visiting Ukraine per year. Today, the cohort of Ukrainian Fulbrighters is actually more than 1,000 Ukrainian and 750 American professors and students. Quite an achievement, and thank you very much for that. And please do more. You know, of course, it's... I, uh, I, we should have in the audience today Dr. Bill Willen from Kent State University. I don't know whether you are here or not, but we, we were told that he would be visiting the, the reunion. Uh, he actually spent a semester in Horlivka State Pedagogical University for Foreign Languages. And years after, after that, uh, in his memories, he remembered this teaching experience in Ukraine. And he, uh, the town of Horlivka in Donetsk Oblast now has been under occupation by Russians since 2014. So when we, when we looked at what uh, Dr. Willen said about his time there, and he noted that, uh, and I'll quote him, when he visited town of Artyomivsk, uh, he, sa he said that one sad diversion during our very informative and ambit tour through the factory was coming across a monument in honor of 3,000 people, mostly Jews, buried alive by Nazis in 1942. Their remains were discovered in the caves when the area was liberated in 1943. Now, 80 years after that happening in Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine, to, to Ukrainians, to, uh, there you are, <laughs> great. <laughs> uh, 80 years, these territories have been right now liberated by Ukrainians, as we speak, you know, our counteroffensive in the, in the east of Ukraine. And unfortunately, again, when we are liberating them from Russians now, we are finding the torture chamber, ch chambers and the mass graves and, uh, you know, the signs of uh, atrocities that, again, should not only be studied and, and, of course, people should be brought to justice for that, but it should not be something that is even possible in the 21st century. So while in Ukraine, our American colleagues could not only observe dramatic changes taking place in Ukraine during this time, not only the transition from the post-Soviet Ukraine to the modern Ukraine, Ukraine that is at the, at the far front of this fight for democracy, but also all, all Fulbright, Fulbrighters that have been there became active agents in rebirth of Ukrainian culture, in rebirth of Ukrainian academic institutions. Uh, the Ukrainian colleagues, like Katya, of course, who were in the United States use on, on this program, also could acquire new knowledge and this new vision and skills and, and uh, broad perspective allowed them also to change Ukraine when they were coming back to Ukraine after being on the scholarship programs here. So I'm confident that the Fulbright not only already played amazing uh, critical, critical role in Ukraine, but can only be stronger in the coming years. And right now, during this time of war and our fight, which again, we, it's very difficult. It's not easy. It will take us a lot of you know, prayers and weapons and, and sanctions and support of all the uh, countries that share the same values to win. But we have no doubt that we will win. We do not have any other choice. And after we win, we will need all the brains and all the hearts and all the Fulbrighters to be there on the ground, helping us to, 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 to leapfrog, to rebuild, to move the country forward, to go through this painful process of you know, finding the new humanity after going through so many difficult, difficult uh, uh, situations, but also I think Ukraine can be the answer to so many global pro pro problems. I mean, Ukraine, Russia has created a lot of risks. You, we all hear about the energy crises, the uh, migration crises, the food crises, everything that Russia is doing in order to uh, defeat us and defeat all the democratic countries. But the key to resolving these questions is actually in Ukraine. Some of them definitely. We can feed the world. 
We can actually, we even now export electricity from Ukraine. Uh, but we can do much more, especially if we can get the Russians out from the nuclear station, which they are holding, uh, which is inconceivable. So there is a great role for all the innovators, and there is a great w role for educators. We have to do it differently, and it's the people who, like you, who can help us transition. Um, I would like to, again, thank you and finish with a story. Uh, in September 2001, the full right office in Ukraine has moved to a new and much more spacious and comfortable office. And everyone who has been to the office in Ukraine uh, remembers it. Uh, the then US ambassador to Ukraine, Carlos Pascual, who is a dear friend as well, scheduled the presentation of US exchange programs at the press conference set for September 12th. It was the September 12th, 2000, um, 2001. And then September 11 happened a day before that. And uh, there was a debate, much like debate we had on the February 25th of this year, what to do after the start of the war. Do we continue with you know, our educational programs, our Ukraine house events, the everything else? And the same was debate in the Fulbright office and in the U.S. Embassy in Kiev, and the decision was made to go ahead with the press conference and open the office, uh, even though, of course, you know, the, uh, you know, everyone was thinking again about the horrible event that just happened. Uh, and I remember that some Ukrainians at first were surprised, you know, that, that the ceremony was not canceled, the ribbon cutting, but then, uh, the point of actually doing it was very clear, and it's very clear to us now. That's why we didn't stop our events either. Because in times like this, we have to very clearly show that the, this, this horrible violence, the terrorism, the war, will never uh, defeat us and will never uh, put us back into some dark times and will never stop us from focusing on what is important. So in times of like we experienced today, in times like U.S. experienced when the September 11 happened, we actually need to enhance everything that makes us humans. We have to study more. We have to um, share more. We have to spend more time on cultural, on cultural studies. We have to really show the world why is it happening and show the true narrative about what is happening. And I think, you know, the fact that we had so many brave journalists uh, in Ukraine from September 20, from February 24th, risking their lives. And unfortunately, we have lost already so many Ukrainian and American and other international journalists. It made a difference that people actually talk about it. And the fact that we can still laugh and we can, we can rejoice and we can return sometimes with children, Ukrainians are returning, and continue to live and continue to show this resilience. Uh, it's also a very important element of the future and current already victory. So with that again, I would like to thank you all for inviting me here. Thank you for having me with you. Um, I wish you exciting two days of the program. And uh, uh, now I will definitely finish with the quote of the Senator Fulbright, who said, to bring a little more knowledge, a little more reason, a little more compassion into world affairs, and thereby increase the chance that nations will learn at last to live in peace and friendship. Amen to that. Thank you.